Hey guys, David here. Welcome back for another mandolin video lesson. And today I'm excited to get to show you this classic intermediate level bluegrass fiddle tune, St. Anne's Reel. <laughs> This one has a really beautiful melody and it's easy to see why it's become a standard in a lot of bluegrass jam scenes. And as far as I can tell, this one has origins in Canada. There's a Bay of St. Anne's over in New Brunswick that this might be linked to. And there's some early recordings as far back as 1920 where you can hear some Montreal fiddle players recording this one under different names. But since then, everyone and their uncle has recorded this tune. And that's actually great because it helps to have a lot of source recordings to reference while you're learning a tune like this. One of my favorite versions of St. Anne's comes from that Bluegrass 96 record where you can hear mandolin player Wayne Benson absolutely slay this. It's so melodic and so simple yet beautiful at the same time. Also, check out Kenny Smith's solo guitar rendition of this tune on his Studebaker record from 1997. I'll put links in the YouTube description below if you're interested in checking out any of these recordings. But even if you just listen to these two versions, you might be kind of surprised at how different the melodies sound. And that's one of the most interesting things about bluegrass instrumental music is that there's tons of room for variation and even improvisation as you get further on. Since this is an aural tradition, I guess people have just put their own stamp on the melody as they've learned it from generation to generation. But when you're first learning a tune like this, that aspect might seem more frustrating than interesting because it becomes hard to parse out what the melody should be. And then once you've learned a basic version of the melody, how do you then take that and come up with your own variations and interpretations to make this tune your own? But that's what we're gonna work on together in this video. We'll start off at square one with the chords and the melody, and then I'll give you the tools necessary to feel confident making those variations on your own to use this as a vehicle for self-expression. And you'll find all the necessary tablature and chord diagrams on screen as we go throughout this video. But if you're interested in having some PDF copies of these handouts, you can find those over at my Patreon site at the link in the cards above. Also, I'm excited. I've even got these new backing tracks that I'm offering patrons. You actually heard one at the beginning of this video when I was playing through the melody, and you can use it as a practice tool to help you try out some of these variations that we'll be looking at in this video. I hope to do that with a lot of tune lesson videos in the future, too. I, I hope it offers a fuller picture of what this song should sound like in a real bluegrass setting. But let me know what you think in the comments below. And while we're at it, thanks so much for the likes and the subscribes. That goes a long way to making these videos possible. But let's try out this tune now. All right, so first up, let's take a look at the chords to this tune. And that's always a good place to start when you come to learning a new piece of music, because if you don't know the chords to the song, it's really gonna limit you and how you can play this song with other people, which is a huge part about the bluegrass tradition. Also, the chords of this tune are a little bit tricky, especially in the B section, and there are a couple different ways to play these chords on the mandolin. So let's look at a couple different options. To start off, let's use some simple open chords and strum patterns to play through this chord progression. And these would be really good options to use if you're one of the only backup instruments in the ensemble that you're playing in. So if you're playing in a duo or a trio, that would be a good option. Or if you're playing in a jam with like eight mandolin players and everyone's chopping, don't just be another chopper. Try to do something different to actually add to the music. And this would be a great way of doing so. So here are those shapes that we're working with for this song. And these are actually some of my favorite chords because they're pretty easy. You usually only have to use one or two fingers and they sound great. I, I still use these probably more than any other chord shape. So don't think about them just as beginner chords. So let's try playing through the A section once with these chord shapes and we'll use a simple strum pattern. Try this one out here. It's down, down, up, down, down. Here's the same thing on the B section now, but by the way, if you've never seen a slash chord notation like this, don't worry. All this is letting us know is what chord we're playing as well as what the bass note for this chord should be. I like to think about this like a fraction where you have D on the top over C sharp, which is that bass note. In other words, the letter on the left is letting you know what the triad is that you're playing, D major in this instance, and then the C sharp is letting you know, okay, we're playing a C sharp as the lowest note of this chord, even though it doesn't necessarily fit with that chord we're playing. And if you look at the chord progression for these couple measures, it makes sense because there's a intuitive descending bass line from the D chord to this C sharp in the bass, 
to finally that B minor chord that you're playing. But all that being said, the mandolin is such a high registered instrument that it doesn't really matter what the lowest note of the chord is, especially if you're playing with a lower instrument like a guitar or a bass. So you don't have to worry about that slash chord if you don't want to. You can just hang on to a regular old D major chord for that entire measure since that's still the primary sound of what's going on through this part of the progression. And one other footnote about the chord progression in this B section here, depending on who you play this with, some people will interchange a G major chord for one or more of the E minor chords that we have in this progression. You can choose to play the chords either way on your own, but when you're playing in a jam with other people, it's always good to listen to see what they're doing first and try to accommodate for their preferences. That being said, we'll just stick to E minor for now. All right, now let's check out the chords to the B section here and we'll try a slight variation on our strum pattern. Here's another common folky sounding strum pattern. It goes something like this. Down, down, up, up, down. This one is a little bit more challenging. Just remember to keep your right hand alternating at a steady pace and just apply your pick to the strings whenever those strums come along. All right, here we go. Next, if you're playing this tune at a proper bluegrass jam with bass, guitar, banjo, fiddle, dobro, whatever, you'll probably want to play chop chords on those backbeats to offer a more percussive sound for the rhythm section to lock into. Here are the five chop chord shapes that I'd recommend using for this tune. Now these shapes are a bit trickier, so be sure to spend some time on the fingerings and the transitions from one chord to the next. But once these feel comfortable, we'll just try out a basic chop chord strum pattern where we're doing all downstrokes, Beats one and three, we'll just play on that G string as placeholders, and then we'll do that chop on the back beat. Beats two and four, where we're playing through all four sets of strings, and then choking the sound of the strings to make that chop. Let's try this out on the A section together. And onto the B section, again, you don't have to worry about that slash chord if you don't want to, just stick to a D chop chord. Let's try it out. All right, on to the melody now. And this tune is in the key of D major, right? You can always tell what the key is by looking at the key signature in the standard notation, or if you don't read music, you can just look at the chords. Usually the first and last chord of the tune or the section you're playing is a good indicator to what key that you're playing in. So since we're starting and ending on a D major chord, chances are we're playing in the key of D here. And since we're in the key of D, it's going to be helpful to review that D major scale. Here's a really simple one octave version of the scale starting on your open D string. Our notes for this key are D, E, F sharp, G, A, B, C sharp, before we get back to D again. And then these same sequence of notes just repeat in higher or lower registers on our instrument. So for instance, this melody also uses some notes on our E string. So it would be helpful to know what notes or frets we have available to us in this key on that string. So on the E string, we have our open E, we have F sharp on the second fret, G on the third fret, A on the fifth fret, and then a high B all the way up on the seventh fret too. So try to familiarize yourself with all these notes. And keep this framework locked into the front of your mind as you learn this tune because nearly all the notes fit within this scale. And by you know, ruling out all the notes in between the scale notes, you're gonna make learning this tune a lot faster and you're gonna minimize mistakes further on. Also, as you get to making variations for this tune, it really helps to know the scale to see what options you have to choose from. The next step in learning a tune like this is to identify the structure and the melodic phrases built into the piece, even before you start playing it. And this tune follows a really standard fiddle tune structure. We have two eight measure sections that repeat. But even within those eight measure sections, you have these little two measure building block phrases, right? And once you identify those phrases, it's pretty easy to see the repetition that's built into this tune. So for the A section here, phrases one and three are actually identical. It's only phrases two and four that you have to watch out for. The 
The B section has this similar four phrase structure too. The only difference is here, the third phrase has a slight melodic variation with this arpeggiated idea. So make a mental note of this change. And once you've got these phrases identified, it's kind of like you have a mental roadmap for the entire tune. It's a lot easier to tell where you are presently within the piece, and then it's a lot easier to anticipate what's coming up next too. All right, now let's check out the melody for the A section, and let me show you a few of the techniques that I chose to use in this arrangement. First up, in measures one and five, I'm using a hammer-on technique to get two notes while just playing one note with my right hand. I'm playing the open E string with my pick, and then coming down on the second fret with my index finger to create this F sharp note. Also in measures two and six, I'm using a slide with my middle finger to get from the second fret to the fourth fret on the D string. Also, we've got some eighth note double stops to watch out for at the end of this section and on the B section, so be sure you're playing both sets of strings clearly with your pick hand. And lastly, watch out for your pick directions here. We want to make sure that our downstrokes line up with the beats in the measure, but a nice rule of thumb for this section is that we can use downstrokes for all of the quarter notes that we see, and then for the eighth notes that are grouped together, we can alternate down and up, always starting with the downstroke. All right, let's try this together now. I'll slowly play through the A section once with the transcription on screen so we can get a feel for this. For the B section now, there are just a couple little nuances. First up, we've got a hammer-on triplet that happens in the second and the sixth measures of this section. And if you've never played this technique before, basically it's an easy way to squeeze in that middle note of the triplet with a hammer-on. So you'll play a downstroke for the first two notes of the triplet, and then you'll grab the third with your consecutive upstroke. That way you don't have to add an extra pick stroke or change your pick directions at all. Also, we've got this different rhythm to watch out for in the fourth measure of the B section. To keep our right hand moving consistently, we have to use these pick strokes. It should be down, up, up, down, down, up. Another weird feature here is we're actually getting outside the key of D for one note in this measure. You see here we have a G sharp instead of a G natural. And I think about this as kind of a chromatic leading tone that gets you back to that A note on the fifth fret, which gets us back to the key of D and back on track. All right, now let's try playing through that B section once together. So now you've laid all the groundwork to learn this tune, but we're just getting started here because the fun really begins when you start tearing the tune apart and putting it back together in different ways. And if you've never done this before, don't worry, because we're gonna talk about some easy, systematic ways of approaching this. First off, when you're making variations for a tune like this, it's really helpful to keep in mind those melodic phrases that we identified earlier in this video. And I think phrases one and three of the A section here are really important. They're the introductory music phrases that lets the listener know that this is St. Anne's real, right? but you'll often hear different interpretations on the other two phrases in this section. So a good place to start is just to keep the melody the same for those introductory phrases and then go somewhere different on phrases two and four. Here are some ideas that I thought up for the A section. Same idea for the B section now. Here are some melodic changes for the second and fourth phrases here. Now I know some of you might be at a total loss as to how to come up with some of those variations on your own but it's really not that difficult. You don't even need to know much about music theory or about music improvisation to get started. As long as you know the melody and the scale of the key that you're playing in, you can already start changing things up just by connecting the most important notes of the melody together in different ways. All you have to do is to identify what those most important notes are. And some people refer to those as target notes. And people might differ in opinion as to what those target notes are for St. Anne's Reel, but a good place to start is to look at what notes fall on the first and the third beats of a measure of 4-4 four, four like we have here. 
and 4-4, four, four, those are going to be the strongest rhythmic parts of the measure. And the notes that fall in those beats are automatically going to be important because they're going to be emphasized more clearly. Take that first two measure phrase from the A section as an example. Here are the notes that happen on the first and the third beats of these measures. And for the first measure, we have two F sharps. For the second measure, we have an open A followed by an F sharp on the D string. Now let's try a slight variation that keeps these notes in the same place on those important beats, but just uses that D major scale as a way of connecting the notes together differently. And hopefully even though I was changing things up here a little bit, the end result should still sound somewhat like St. Anne's Real because we're still keeping the same core skeleton of the melody the same. Let's do the same thing for the first phrase of the B section now. Here we also have two F sharps for that first measure. And then for the second measure we have an A note followed by a G note. Now let's try to intersect these notes in a different way like this. So hopefully you see it's actually not too daunting to come up with your own variations for a tune like this as long as you think about that melody at a little deeper level like we have. And I'd encourage you to use this process to come up with some variations of your own and once you have them memorized see if you can interchange one variation from the next as you play through the tune. You might even come up with some new variations on the spot which is kind of what we're after. And that's the beauty about playing these tunes is because once you've opened up the floodgate to all these possibilities these tunes become living breathing entities where you don't have to play the tune the same way. It's almost like every time you come back to the tune, it's a brand new musical experience, which is what I love about playing this music. So you've got all the tools now, but if you want even more, be sure to check out all the things going on over at my Patreon site. That's where you can get those PDF transcriptions and the play along backing tracks and a bunch more. And if you're interested in learning more, check out the videos that you see here on screen or hit the playlist to watch all of my fiddle tune lesson videos. Thank you guys so much for the likes, the subscribes. Thanks for watching. I'll see you guys in the next video.